you think this is something that could happen? Um, no. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris discuss video game urban legends, which are true. How do they come to be, and how do they spread? Plus, Tetris Ultimate, XCOM 2, and impressions from E3 2017. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 105 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And once again, Doc is unable to join us, so it's going to be just me and Jim today, which is uh, probably for the best because our topic of discussion is uh, a little bit less than academic, actually. Uh, yes. We're talking about uh, urban legends when it comes to video games, things uh, both inside and outside of games. Uh, some are true. Some are true. Some have been proven false, but others might be true. <laughs> we'll never know, or will we? Uh, and actually, you know, I say it's unacademic, but in a way, this is kind of part of the culture, and it's interesting to study kind of from a, you know, how do these sort of urban legends come to be? How do they propagate? I don't think we're going to be exploring that all too much, but uh, so no, inter- I think, interesting I think to talk we can, about. yeah. And and the differences in how they, they are proliferated today as opposed to, say, back in the 1980s, before we had um the internet yeah. and youtube and game forums are you saying we didn't have the internet in the 80s uh the general public didn't know <laughs> or did we or did we <laughs> stay tuned to find out no we didn't <laughs> uh but first we have some opening segments for you including the button mosh get ready for the button mosh where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately well, uh, I'm going to start off this mosh, Chris, if you don't mind. Please do. Um, I've been playing... This is a very polite mosh. Yes, it is. It's very <laughs> polite. Uh, we're actually... Because there's only two of us, so it's not really much of a mosh pit. <laughs> uh, and plus, we, we we tried the whole crowd surfing thing, which doesn't really work with two people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've been playing a lot of Tetris lately, actually. Um, been really getting back into it. Um, it was a game that, of course, I played a lot when I was um, a kid, mostly on the Game Boy. Um, and of course, I've played multiple other versions, such as the um, the Nintendo, the NES version, the arcade version, um, various versions on other handheld devices, including and, and other systems like the PS2. The one I've been playing recently is actually on uh, the PS4 called Tetris Ultimate. Mm. Um, just for convenience sake, it was easy for me to get and it was on sale. Um, but for me, Tetris is a, a game that I can kind of pick up and play for anywhere from a couple of minutes to you know 15 minutes and be done with it and put it away if i want to so it's really good for gaming in short bursts sure yeah um and that's kind of where it also i i feel that it's a um for me at least a relaxing experience almost because i'm able to get in and have this um kind of jolt of you know fast-paced gaming and then when it's done, I kind of I kind of breathe a sigh of relief, and then mm-hmm. I can kind of go on about my day or, or do something else that I maybe need to do to uh, take responsibility in some other way, mm-hmm. um, possibly uh, make dinner or wash my clothes and do other adult things. So <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you sort of uh, sprinkle Tetris throughout your day, then like the day seems a little bit less uh, tedious, I suppose. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that, that I found in going back and playing Tetris is a couple of things. One, um, practice actually does make you better. Mm. Uh, it seems, <laughs> seems a weird a weird statement, but uh, when I first started playing, um, essentially Tetris Ultimate has uh, various modes like battle mode, um, marathon mode, sprint mode. So it's got different sort of like gaming modes, but it's, uh, similar to most most versions of Tetris have various modes. But one of the things that they do that I thought was interesting was um, for the initial mode, marathon mode, it only goes to level 15. And once you beat level 15, it's over. And so I thought that was a little bit odd. Um, that you can essentially beat the game. Well, in order, if you want to play forever, there's a mode called Endless Mode. You have to unlock it. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a little odd until I started playing Marathon Mode and realized I couldn't even get to level 15, let mm. alone beat it. So it it was it's they, they sort of gate the challenge, which I thought was kind of clever, 
because that is a challenge and that's how they kind of they give you um in this version of tetris tetris ultimate um they give they they present your progression as a form of belts as in like martial like arts martial kinda. art belts gotcha. so you start out as, as a white belt and you kind of as you beat different um tasks in the game you you level up and get new belts and they even have bots in the game that you can challenge in the different battle modes if you don't want to play online um that are are belts they have belts as well like the orange belt or the the green belt the purple belt so um the challenges were actually based on beating certain levels in marathon mode or in endless mode so um as i was playing through i noticed you know at first i would really struggle to even to get too far past level uh 10 or 12 ish um at first and then i found myself getting closer and closer to that level 15 sort of barrier and eventually beat it and have, and have moved on to to endless mode and trying to get as far as i can in there what i found interesting though and what i've really been enjoying lately is trying to see how far i can get in um sprint mode mm -hmm. which is essentially um it's actually a pretty pretty common and popular activity among the tetris uh, tetris playing community tetris players where essentially you have to um clear 40 lines within uh well as quickly as you can mm -hmm. basically so assuming that you start at level one which i mean generally you do you would start at the, the first level that means that you're going to um progress through through levels as you normally do every 10 levels you get you go to the next level which means things speed up so in this particular mode things are not going are honestly not going that fast at all so in theory you shouldn't have any trouble staying alive well the problem here is that you're trying to do everything as fast as possible mm -hmm. so you could certainly get into a situation where you mess up because you're just simply going too quickly and um for me when i first started playing um at first i thought wow i can't even there's no way that you can possibly do this in under three minutes that's that's what i thought mm -hmm. at first and then of course i was able to do it in under three minutes and i thought well you can't do it in two and a half minutes and i was able to do it in two and a half minutes and so um you get you get progressively better wow as you continue playing which i thought was very interesting so um i was able to get down to two minutes and i was very proud of that i was able to you know break that barrier and i thought well i wonder what the record is and i go into the records in an ultimate and of course they're all hacked because uh. the records say um zero <laughs> zero is the record by the way obviously obviously that's impossible right, so there's right. there's a hack there um so i thought i was curious and i thought well i'll just go online i i would guess the record is uh, well, what would you guess the record would be uh 30 seconds oh really okay well i guessed about a minute and 30 seconds mm. or possibly even a minute um because that's if you've played through it it's really hard to do to get to get those levels well i find out the actual record is about 17 seconds oh wow and when you watch them when you watch this is this one guy from i believe he's from china um he broke first he broke the record which was even to get below 20 seconds and then he just kept breaking his own record and it's unbelievable when you watch him play because it, he moves so quickly mm -hmm that it just defy like it looks like it has to be fake <laughs> like how can someone react this perfectly moving that quickly it's probably instinct at this point honestly it is and and just extremely fast decision making mm -hmm. um it was at that point that i realized that i suck at tetris um, <laughs> <laughs> or at least in comparison i actually thought i was pretty good i was actually getting kind of a big head i was like oh i'm getting really good at this yeah and, <laughs> and then i see someone that goes that fast and realize hmm, i'm actually not as good as i thought i was <laughs> uh but it's it's been a fun experience anyway despite the fact that I, I know i will never actually beat the world record um it is enjoyable to kind of set personal personal goals mm -hmm. and uh break them yeah and uh speaking of uh, difficult things uh i've been playing xcom 2 uh and so this was um i played a little bit of xcom enemy unknown which was kind of the reboot they did in i want to say 2012 mm. Um, really enjoyed that game. I thought it was really cool. I never quite finished it. I think I was very close to the end, but, uh, I just kind of like fizzled out at some point. And when I revisited a couple years later, I realized that I was late enough in the game where, uh, as good as I might have been at the time, I forgot all my tactics and all my techniques. And so I just got wiped because <laughs> I, I had a very particular build that was kind of like high damage, low defense. And so I, I had no margin for error. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'm going to just go in and play XCOM 2. And what's interesting about this one, and this isn't really a spoiler because this is something that they even sort of feature in the trailers. Um, at the end of Enemy Unknown, basically the aliens um, manage to infiltrate XCOM. They wipe you guys out and the aliens have taken over the world. And essentially what they've done is built like kind of this puppet government called Advent. 
uh, where it is humans who are basically cooperating with the aliens to like uplift humanity and all this different stuff. It's totally totalitarian and <laughs> uh, terrible. And so XCOM is now basically uh, leading the resistance in a way. Ah, la resistance. Vive la resistance. Uh, and so immediately you can tell there's a very different feel. Um, you are underfunded, understaffed. Uh, you are constantly on the run, basically have to use very like sort of hit and run tactics. And that's very evident even in the missions themselves because there's very often a a countdown of you have this many turns before it's mission failure because you've got interceptors coming in that are going to wipe you out. So you need to basically get in and get out uh, before that sort of stuff happens or before they destroy the thing you're trying to retrieve or whatever the case might be. Um, And so whereas in XCOM, the best strategy was always to be like really slow and steady, make sure you stay in cover. Don't make yourself too, or don't put yourself in the open. Um, Like really take your time and be safe. In this one, they really, push that because you have to get to where you need to go complete the objective and hopefully not get yourself killed in the process uh and then like i played on normal mode which they said you know it's like recommended for people who have some experience with xcom or tactical games in general so I'm like yeah i've played xcom i'll be fine uh <laughs> it is extremely difficult even on normal um and this thing happens where you can very quickly snowball a couple of failed missions and a few lost um crew members that sort of thing um really puts you in a bad spot moving forward to where you just keep going and going and going and like you just get worse and worse and worse until it's like okay this is impossible i'm not, there's no way i'm gonna win i'm just gonna go ahead and restart uh and so even on uh, rookie mode which i tried out just it's like okay i'm gonna see what the game has to offer um i started it i was doing extremely well and then uh you hit that point at which uh you know you start that snowball effect and it was slower this time but you could mm-hmm. you could tell what was happening um i think one of the things well, I, I really do enjoy the difficulty of it, and every decision really does matter. I'm actually playing in Iron Man mode, where it auto-saves constantly. You can't go back and reload old saves, that sort of deal. Um, I just kind of like the emergent gameplay and the emergent narrative that comes out of that. It's really neat to me. So, it, as difficult as it is, it typically feels fair, at least, you know? Um, I would say probably my biggest frustration has been with what they call uh, ruler characters. These are enemies that appear that are kind of like more powerful counterparts of the typical units you tend to see. Um, and they're extremely like they have extremely high health. So you'd have to have your entire squad focus them with a much more powerful weaponry than I have at the time that they start appearing. Hmm. Uh, and I think that there's like a roguelike element to XCOM. So it's possible that they, they tend to sort of show up, uh, semi, semi randomly, um, during missions that have nothing to do with say hunting them down. They just sort of, it's like, Oh, I finished my objective, but then here's this guy between me and evac. And this is really a problem. Um, so they are extremely high health, extremely hard to kill, uh, and they can one shot my people uh, pretty easily. And so that alone, it's, it's difficult, but, you know, I could deal with it. They have this ability called ruler reaction, where typically when you have one of your characters move and do an action, you kind of have like two actions. So you can like move and move for extra distance or you can move and fire, that sort of thing. Um, one action, not even a full action, uh, whenever a character says just moves then a ruler is able to react and they are able to take a turn (laughs) pretty much after every single thing you do Mm. to where um, like if you're just in a bad position when they show up, they'll wipe you super easily. Uh, And you don't necessarily know when they're coming because it's like, oh, hello. (laughs) I just rounded the corner and there you are. Um, Uh, That doesn't actually sound fair at all. (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) It's uh, this is like the, the one time in the game where like I've been frustrated to the point of, I don't feel like this is my fault anymore, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I'm stuck on this mission right now where my ship's been shot down. I have to take out this device that's keeping it uh, down, keeping me unpowered. And I don't know if it's like they always intended for a ruler to be on this map or if it's just my bad luck that it's there. Uh, but basically, I'm stuck in this loop of if I fail, it's a critical mission failure and the game's over. And so they let you restart the mission, but I can't beat the mission. <laughs> so uh, I'm the game. I just have to go and restart and try again. Uh, so there are a few frustrations in that regard, um, but aside from the rulers, uh, really cool game. Um, like I said, they do a great job of kind of giving you that you are on the run and you're the resistance sort of feel. Um, highly recommended for anyone who's into tactical games, into uh, games with cool emergent stories. Next come to. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Recently, we have had biggest gaming show 
of the year, I would say, Mm -hmm. um, E3 2017, the first one open to the public. And we talked a little bit about this in um, previous shows. Mm -hmm. But uh, now that it's concluded, I kind of think it'd be cool to have our reflections on it and talk about games that stood out to us. And uh, for me, I think the first the first thing that I think of when I think of E3 is Metroid. Yeah, Metroid is back. <laughs> and what's funny is we were doing our um, we were doing our look ahead to E3 briefly in a couple episodes ago, and very reckless. A reckless speculation <laughs> yeah. was extra reckless. Yeah, and we di- we didn't even mention Metroid because I think in years past we're like, oh, it'd be cool if they if they announced Metroid, but mm-hmm. they never do. And I think at this point we're just like we didn't even mention it because it's every year I've said. <laughs> Oh, it's, they're going to announce Metroid, and every year I've been disappointed. Yeah. And so on that show, I just I, c- I couldn't bring myself to say mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. And and just as soon as you forget about right, it, <laughs> two Metroids. Yeah. So the exciting thing about this, um, to be fair, Metroid Prime Four, I'm extremely excited for mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. But all they really did was announce it. Yeah. They didn't actually show any footage from the game. So it's obviously in very early development. Um, it's not being designed by Retro, but it is being designed by a new internal design team. Oh, interesting. Um, which I, I find, I think is great. I mean, I think they're, they're giving other people a chance. They, they've, um, they, they feel like they're, I'm sure it's going to be taken in a little bit of a different direction, I'm, I'm assuming, but because they're not calling it Metroid four or Metroid with some other title, they're calling it Metroid prime four. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me suggests that it's going to be a first person Metroid mm-hmm. game. Yeah. It's going to have similar gameplay to the Metroid prime series. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have taken, we, we've uh, honestly, the, the development the design, the general design of FPS has um, evolved yeah. over time. As yeah. Of course, all games do mechanically. We, we get a little bit better at certain things here and there. And so I'm interested to see what, metroid prime 4 might look like mm-hmm. which to me i still hold the original metroid prime up as one of my all-time favorite games oh, yeah, and one of the good. all-time one of the all-time best games in my opinion um period it holds up well i mean even it graphically really does. like you can tell that it's a gamecube but it still looks good mm-hmm. and so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the series and i'm very excited but the other announcement of course metroid wise was uh, metroid samus returns mm-hmm. which is a remake of metroid 2 and um it's they showed a gameplay trailer. Mm-hmm. We already get to see how it plays. Um, they ha- they've added in uh, melee attacks mm-hmm. to it as well. Um, it looks 360 degree shooting, which yes, is interesting. It yeah. looks really cool. It is a 2D Metroid, but it does have um, it, it 3D models, mm-hmm. but 2D, 2.5D. Yeah, um, it looks great. Um, it looks like it's going to play great. I'm mm-hmm. very excited. This was something that I mentioned way back when I talked about another Metroid 2 remake mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. some of the rumors that oh, well, maybe they're actually planning to remake Metroid 2 themselves Mm -hmm. well it looks like it turns out they have been because this game is very far in development and is actually coming out in the fall of this year Mm. so really we only have a few more months to months to wait and this one is going to be on the 3ds yeah yeah so i'm i am so excited about that yeah i am too um i i saw that and i i it it looks great the the only thing that um, i think pulled a little bit of my excitement from samus returns is one Having played another Metroid 2 remake, I thought it was a fantastic game. Mm-hmm. So it does, it already has competition in that sense. Mm-hmm. And the other the other issue is, sure, I've seen how great this is, but it's kind of like the mystery box scenario where um, someone offers you a boat or the mystery box, kind of like an old, mm-hmm. an old family guy joke, I believe. But um, the concept there being that someone offers you something great, right? And you're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. But there's this mystery box. Ooh, what's in the mystery box, right? <laughs> and that's kind of what Metroid Prime 4 is because they didn't reveal anything. So mm-hmm. to me, I see I see Samus Returns. It looks great. It's a new Metroid game. It's a two it's a new 2D Metroid game. It, so I, I'm already mechanically 2D, of course. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very excited for that. But then I see the Metroid Prime 4, just the teaser image. Oh, it's being made. Well, it's a mystery. What's it gonna be? It could be incredible. It could be horrible. I don't know. <laughs> but because it could be anything. Uh, uh, I mean, we know it's Metroid, but it could be practically anything in terms of the gameplay. Sure. Um, that automatically just conjures up, whoa, this could be the best game ever. <laughs> it's just, it could be the best game ever. So I'm going to pick the mystery box every time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, but what other uh, E3 news were you kind of uh, aware of? Because I know that I personally, like I, I sort of mentioned last time we talked about this, um, I sort of fall on Nintendo and then not much else. So, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with with Nintendo, other news there. Um, I know that they talked about a new Pokemon, a Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to pronounce Pokemon. I'm going to be perfectly honest. with I, you. I think that's close enough. Okay, close enough. <laughs> um, it's 
there's going to be a new Pokemon game for the Switch, which I'm sure people are excited about. Mm-hmm. I'm not really a big Pokemon fan, but mm-hmm. po- I pronounce it differently every time. It's just going to be my thing. It's po- po- Pokemon. 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 Yeah. Um, but uh, I've, well, so you might have to edit that out. It's horrible. Um, no, don't. So, but yeah, that's that's coming. Um, they did they did show more um, levels in Mario Mario um, Super Mario Odyssey. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, I know some people. Some of the people from my company where I work actually did go to E three and got to play Super Mario Odyssey. Oh, nice. So I have some first hand impressions. Um, well, for me, I guess it would be a second hand, third hand, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's looking really good. It, it, it apparently it plays great. Nice. Um, I got the feedback I got was um, wow. <laughs> so I'm really excited for it. Um, I'm even more dedicated to eventually finding a switch. Maybe one day <laughs> if it'll ever be in stores um, and the scalpers will stop buying like 50 of them every time they show up. I hate those scalpers so much. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was one um, dragon ball fighter Z. I think caught a lot of people off guard. Mm. Um, it's essentially a new, a new fighting, a new 2d two dimensional fighting game um, with beautiful um, anime hand-drawn graphics oh, wow. that, that look just like the show. In fact, the animation quality, quite frankly, is much better than the show. Hmm. Um, it is developed by Arc System Works, which you may know as the, the designers of Guilty Gear, Guilty Gear and Blast did, Blue. Um, Persona 4 Arena. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm familiar with their style. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're very highly regarded in terms of not just um, their their animation quality, mm-hmm. 2D animation quality, and um, their art style, but also um, mechanics. Yeah. Uh, Guilty Gear is is very popular in the, and various Guilty Gear games um, are very popular in the esports community. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blast Blue has its own plays as well. And I feel that, of course, the Dragon Ball property is massive. It's mm-hmm. blowing up right now um, with Dragon Ball Super being like the new official series canon series from the original creator akira toriyama you might say it's going super saiyan it's going super saiyan i'm, I'm just saying <laughs> um but yeah dragon ball fighter z looked incredible and it actually took the wind out of the sails of capcom oh, when wow. they yeah. showed marvel versus capcom infinite which we, we talked about that last week yeah, yeah. we did i mean it, it it looks ugly frankly the, the character models look ugly it's, it's kind of become a meme now where mm. um chun li doesn't even look like chun li uh dante from devil may cry looks Worse than he than his character model from 2008's wow. DMC4. Um, it just looks like the game is sloppy and unfinished, and yet it's going to come out before Dragon Ball Fighter Z, hmm. which looked unbelievable. So I think it kind of definitely took away from that from that game. Wow. Um, the other one I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about a little bit about um, Beyond Good and Evil Two, just to kind of mention that as being a kind of like a hey we're still here announcement mm-hmm. because, lots of hype around that right and it was hyped back in i believe it was in i want to say 2009 but i'm probably it probably was after 2009 but um because that's geez that's almost 10 years ago so probably not that long ago but there there uh, several years back it was shown at e3 as a cinematic trailer mm-hmm. people got very excited and because the original game is hi- is yeah. highly regarded it, it was reason. one of those like cult classics that people are just like clamoring for a sequel for right. 15 years and right. like now they're finally doing it yeah right but the last trailer nothing happened never went anywhere and so now it's back and my initial reaction is so <laughs> because yeah. all we've seen once again is a cinematic trailer that means nothing you can make anybody can make a cinematic trailer are, are you actually going to make it a video game out of this <laughs> what does it pl- how does it play you know, so I'm not ex- I'm not excited at all, to be honest with you, because to me, it's still vaporware until I see something. Uh, I never even played the original, so mm. I'm, I'm kind of neutral on it. I might go back and play the first one at least at some point because I hear it's good. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it's one of those sort of non stories to me. It's like I, I acknowledge that it's happening, but it uh, d- doesn't doesn't make me excited. What are your thoughts on uh, Spider-Man? Did you see any of the Spider-Man trailer? Uh, no, not really, actually. I saw a little bit of footage here and there, um, but not not much. What were your thoughts on it? Well, I'm a pretty big Spider-Man fan just in general, and um, I'm, I'm kind of excited and also nervous mm-hmm. because from what they showed, the, the gameplay itself looks kind of similar to um, the, Ar- the Batman Arkham games, oh, okay. where you're sort of stealthy. You're you're trying not to be seen, and then when you are seen, well, you can take you can take the enemy down from behind, stuff like that, with your web shooters, of course, or just kind of jump on them from like above or what have you. But then, of course, when you get into combat, it's it's similar to the Arkham games in which things kind of slow down as a punch is coming. You can like counter it, you can dodge, and uh, you attack, so you look really cool. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, so kind of like with the Batman Arkham games, the combat system makes you feel like Batman. From what I saw, 
of Spider-Man. The combat system looks like it's going to make you feel like Spider-Man, which is really cool. And I hear good things about the web swinging, too. Right. And that was the other part of it, where you you have um, Manhattan. They sort of made this uh, like kind of open Manhattan space. And you can, um, between between story missions, you can go and kind of do like side side missions. With it. In Manhattan, you can swing around the city. It looks pretty cool. The uh, web swinging mechanics look pretty awesome. The one thing that concerned me was the whole sequence they showed at E3... The scene itself looks really cool, and it looks like something you would see in a Spider-Man movie. It looks awesome. The problem is that the gameplay in this section is really just quick time events. Mm-hmm. It's, it's hitting the right button at the right time, and then cool things happen. Mm-hmm. That can work in extreme moderation, but of course, that does worry me because quick time events, you're not really playing a game at that point. Mm-hmm. You're just you're just basically um, press button to continue cool cinematic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've I've kind of long thought that I'd be interested in a game that kind of takes quick time events, but like treats them in kind of like a more thoughtful way mechanically to where like you can have like lots of cool stuff happening, but it's a little bit more intentional. Like I'm thinking I'm going to do thing like action type X as opposed to action type Y, you know, right. You mean you're like you're you're choosing. Yeah, you're making choices. Right. And so that, and that could be interesting. This one, it, it didn't feel that way at all, but mm-hmm. it just depends on how they use it. And I don't yeah. want to be too down on it. The game does look great. I'm certainly interested, but uh, we'll just see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the kind of the things that I wanted to mention, too, we already mentioned Metroid, which is obviously huge news, uh, Super Mario Odyssey. I also watched a couple of uh, Nintendo's tournaments. It's kind of interesting because in a way they're almost sort of saying like, hey, look at us. We have esports through uh, Splatoon 2 uh, Pokemon tournament, which they're making a director's cut version for the Switch. Oh, yeah. uh, With a couple of new characters, which Mm -hmm. is kind of neat. Uh, And ARMS. I didn't watch the ARMS tournament, but I did watch... um, most, if not all, of Splatoon 2 and um, Pokemon Tournament. Wow. And we got to play a little bit of ARMS actually yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Very, very briefly. Um, and I was playing it on a <laughs> on one of the Pro Controllers, which I wanted to try it on the, the motion controllers. To yeah. See how that's different. All of us. Uh, I was playing on the Pro as well. Mm-hmm. It was pretty cool, actually. Uh, played with Richard. Almost beat him. <laughs> yep. Um, and so... Pokemon tournament, you know, looked really good. Uh, it was really interesting. To, it's always interesting to watch that at a competitive level because it's a it's a neat game. Um, Splatoon two though looks really good. I'm really excited about that. Um, and one of the kind of fun moments actually is at the end of the Pokemon tournament, mm. um, the two winners they're being presented with their awards by a couple of the directors from Bandico or uh, Namco Bandai, and then um, as kind of like a surprise thing, they put down the awards that they're presenting and they actually challenge them. So the the sort of final boss, if you will, was the champions of this tournament versus the game's directors. Uh, and the directors actually won, which is interesting. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's surprising. Mm-hmm. So uh, now to be fair, uh, the, kind of like what I think was happening is that there was on each team, it was kind of like teams of two fighting each other through the tournament. And so there's a YouTube personality and then there was a Twitch personality. The Twitch personalities are typically like the pro gamers, the ones who are in tournaments all the time. And so the pro gamer that was in this matchup um, wasn't playing his main. He was still really good, but he switched characters. And I wonder if that was like kind of to take it a little bit easier. or I don't know. A few other things. Um, Wolfenstein 2 was announced. Mm-hmm. I was a big fan of New Order. In fact, yeah. I think that was one of the first games that we... Uh, we talked about that was our first round table yeah, yeah. so um of course I, I i loved old blood which was the expansion that came out standalone expansion mm-hmm. so i'm excited for wolfenstein 2 yeah looks good um somehow bj uh, blaskowitz has survived mm-hmm. it's really not that surprising honestly so and <laughs> I, I didn't really follow the xbox or the uh, playstation press conferences oh, no? uh my impression of the xbox one and i've, I've been told this is in a, xbox all was, one x yeah <laughs> and it's recursive which is interesting yep. um but like we have pre- come 360 degrees. My, my impression of that was basically that that was all they were talking about was just like, hey, now you can play Minecraft in 4K. No, it was actually a lot of game announcements. In mm. fact, um, th- it was actually a good show. They talked about um, the Xbox One X. They talked about the sort of games that you you would you would get on it. And I felt it was actually a pretty good a pretty good show. Um, Nintendo's show, as you know, was because you did watch that one mm-hmm. was a great show too. Yeah, it was so, it was short, but it yeah. got got what it needed to across. And for me, they won mainly uh, it's because I'm biased. They mentioned Metroid. Yeah, <laughs> to me won. instant win. Right, and then um, Sony's was honestly just kind of a retread. Sure. I mean, they showed a, f- a little bit of extra footage from certain games, like for example, we saw more of Spider Man. We saw more of of the new uh, God of War, or as it has become known, uh, Dad of War, but. Really nothing exciting, mm-hmm. uh, no real excite- excitement um, came out of it. So um, I feel like they kind of lost in a way. Mm-hmm. Ubisoft had their own show and they showed things like 
um, the Mario and Rapids game crossover oh, yeah. game which, which i'm i'm, Kingdom I'm weirdly excited about actually really yeah because like it, it reminds me of xcom mm. uh, because it's got like this tactical gameplay to it and so um you know as, as much fun as people have been making of the idea it's like I, it actually looks kind of cool to me yeah so. i i ended up i was kind of nasty a little <laughs> bit not 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 directly to anyone in particular but um i was involved in the like let's make just hop on the bandwagon and make fun of this game <laughs> sort of thing on 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 twitter mm-hmm. um Again, didn't say anything too nasty, but I, I certainly was quite negative. Mm. And then I saw um, the E3 presentation and the designer of the game. I don't know if you've you heard of this, mm-hmm. but he was sitting in the audience and he had Miyamoto came out and, and talked a little bit about the game to introduce it mm-hmm. and personally thanked him for his work on the game. Oh, and wow. he um, start, you know, he teared up and oh, he actually yeah. was a very emotional moment for him because, mm-hmm. of course, Miyamoto, I mean, he's a legend. He's yeah. a gaming legend. Mm-hmm. And I think I would have probably reacted the same way yeah. if I was able to work on a game for Nintendo yeah. and Miyamoto thanked me for it. I, I probably would have quite, uh, teared up too. Yeah. No, so I yeah. I, when I saw that, I go, oh, well, I feel really bad because <laughs> even if I don't want to play this game, it's clear that this person really put, cares. He yeah. cares. He put his his full effort into this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked last week some about um, the designer's vision a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it feels like he certainly had a vision and he executed it. So mm-hmm. I, I feel like I kind of have to give the game a chance now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, and actually the one more thing I want to mention, speaking of all these press conferences um, was Devolver. Um, I guess they sort of made their first real E3 appearance in a way. Um, and for those of you who don't know who Devolver is, um, they even sort of mentioned this in their video. Um, they're, they're a publisher mainly of indie games. Uh, so they did things like uh, Luft Rousers and other sort of games along those lines. And um, it was funny because they I don't think they had an actual live press conference, but they had a video that was sort of suggesting that they did. Uh, and you could tell very quickly that it's a satire. It's a parody. Um, and uh, the the way that the like the the kind of the president character comes up and starts presenting is uh, like kind of very condescending and definitely very like sales pitchy. Uh, like get excited about this because we're doing this. Or we're doing that. And like just making fun of those press conferences in general. Um, and then it just starts getting really weird <laughs> um, because they start talking about like this new feature, for example, um, uh, like, you know, people lately have been pre-ordering games and like buying like pre-alpha versions of games. But we think that that's not early enough. We think you should be able to preview a game at the moment of its conception. <laughs> and so they had like this little cameo by um, uh, Suda51, uh, who basically was like, apparently there's a miscommunication. He's like, OK, I don't want to be involved with this. It's like, OK, so we're actually uh, not featuring Suda51 in this new program of ours um honestly that's something that they they have sort of done in i believe it was australia i saw the the images they are already selling uh pre-orders of death stranding Mm -hmm. they had a fake box in the stores that you could actually buy and that game is in pretty a pretty early stage at this point yeah so it's kind of what i mean they made a joke about Mm -hmm. it but it seems like this might be happening in some parts of the world yeah no they're they're definitely like making fun of the trends that we were seeing Mm -hmm. and i thought one of the funniest things that toward the end was um their new system for uh, comment created content uh, where basically people who uh, uh, are commenting about like how they don't like that this isn't in the game or they want to add this or want to change this. Uh, the games would just react to that. Uh, and it's like you type in the comment and it happens. And then the, uh, the person um, starts like getting this, like their, her nose starts bleeding and she's kind of like shouting about how innovative and crazy this is and things are just going crazy. And, um, oh yeah, you can pay for DLC by throwing money at your computer screen. <laughs> nice. Um, I've tried that before in yeah. games and it doesn't usually work out for me. Yeah. Um, and then her head explodes. And so is, is this really very weird, surreal sort of thing, but it's still, uh, was kind of like a funny sort of parody of the industry. <laughs> uh, so if anyone who hasn't seen that yet should go watch it at least for the, uh, the, the interest value, I suppose. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. Let's go ahead and transition into our our meaty topic of discussion for today, which uh, is urban legends and gaming, and uh, what's real, what's not, and uh, what sort of impact has it had on gamers. So uh, I'm just going to start us off with, in my opinion, an one of the more interesting urban legends and then we'll talk about some that may be real some that were proven real later on Mm -hmm. some that were proven false but then later influenced game design Mm -hmm. um so i want to go ahead and talk about a game called um polybius 
Uh, Polybius is a game that, um, it, at least as the, the urban legend goes, it was a game released in um, 1981 in limited numbers, an arcade game, to multiple different arcades throughout the country. Um, but a limited run, so only a few of them were around. And the way that the story goes is that this particular ca- this particular game um, was actually created by the um, U.S. government and specifically uh, Black Ops part of the U.S. government, um, the same government ag- agency behind MK Ultra hmm. and other um, crazy conspiracy theories that you may have heard before related to people like uh, the Men in Black. Not Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones, the fun men in black, <laughs> but uh, the bad men in black that might, you know, kill you if they think that you have um, information that might threaten the government or... Well, this was the Cold War, so... Yes. Uh, yeah, very true, When during the uh, the early 80s. And um, part of Polybius, apparently, it was, um, it was a game in which after you played, um, you would suffer vivid nightmares. <laughs> um, you could potentially develop suicidal tendencies and kill yourself um it was supposed to be um actually psychotropic so almost like the play in the game was a drug and it in a way and um there was essentially supposed to be this like very very violent strobe effect Hmm. that could trigger epileptic seizures um even in people that were not prone to epileptic seizures Hmm. um as the story goes um for the few arcades that did have a, a, a polybius cabinet um every once in a while there, you would see men show up. Oh, well, it says men, but I suppose it could have been women too. I don't know if they're so dedicated to the men in black that they don't have ladies in black. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but essentially, you would you would see government operatives show, showing up in you know black suits. Um, you know these very stodgy people that would show up and and they would get um, collect data from the machine and it would be shut down for a little while and they would sometimes take the machine away and then replace it that kind of thing. <laughs> so um, that's essentially the story. Um, the truth behind it is honestly we don't know. Um, it's become this huge, this huge urban legend that is that has influenced um, gaming for a while. It's become a part of gaming culture. Uh, the Simpsons referenced it in in a, in a uh, one of their one of their shows. Huh. Um, various other TV shows have referenced it as like kind of this mythical game. There's actually been games that have been released on mobile platforms and um, excuse me on mobile platforms and handheld um, con- and consoles and indie games that are named Polybius that are sort of like almost an homage to this fake game. So it's something that everyone's aware of. Um, I think I kind of want to ask you, Chris, uh, what do you think about the possibility of this being real? And we'll kind of do this with all of these, it's like fact or fiction for the ones that we don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think this is something that could happen? Um, I no. (laughs) Certainly, let me put it this way. Um, I don't necessarily mean everything about it because Mm -hmm. clearly there has to be some exaggeration, but could the government have released a video game that intentionally was meant to um in some way affect gamers like disturb ga- disturb the player rather in, in in a particular way and then so that they could gather that data and use it somehow i could it's possible i i don't see it actually happening um especially at a time when i think that um games weren't taken seriously enough that they would find it actually to be a useful tool um i think that if they were trying to do something like that it wouldn't be with an arcade cabinet uh that's just my thought but um I think it's a hundred percent real. <laughs> now, um, I, I, honestly, my my perception of it is that it's not something that I would necessarily put past a government agency, particularly today, like you say. Mm. In fact, um, the military is has used games like, um, oh geez, I want to say it was called was it called Army of One? It was a few years ago where they released essentially a, a game that was about it's like a military, almost like a military simulation, and they mm-hmm. actually released it to the public, but it was meant to be almost an army recruitment tool. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, they were also upfront about it. They didn't. Mm-hmm. They didn't hide that fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I wouldn't necessarily put it past um, the government to develop games specifically to get a reaction. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to some of the things that it was supposed to do, it's pretty outlandish. Yeah. Um, So I'm going to go to a few fun, uh, more fun urban legends. A little less Men in Black. Yeah. (laughs) And we'll actually return to some of the Men in Black stuff later. Oh, boy. Dark magic and voodoo curses and such. But um, I wanted to touch on a few that, that... we know are false, but maybe also had a kernel of truth in them. Uh, and the first one I wanted to mention, um, as I know you're you're a big uh, uh, Sanic fanboy, we established very early on in the podcast. I suppose so. Yeah. Um, Super Smash Bros. Melee. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a game where uh, there was this rumor, rampant rumor for a long time, that both Sonic and Tails were 
available in that game. And I think I heard this one. I don't think I remember Tails, but people were claiming that you could unlock Sonic and that sort of thing. Right. And it was it was kind of kind of a big deal. Uh, Super Smash Bros, of course, had already been this sleeper hit on the N64, but it came out towards the the very tail end of the N64 life cycle. So there were some people that didn't really get to experience it Mm. or um, if they did, they didn't get to play it maybe as much as they, they may have wanted to. And so for the GameCube, it was actually one of the earlier releases for the system. In fact, I want to say it was even a launch title. It was. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Um, with with Sonic um, being such a big video game character, there was – who knows where it started, but clearly the <laughs> internet uh, helped uh, propagate this rumor. And uh, essentially the, the idea here was that – if you could defeat uh, 20 fighting wireframes in cruel melee mode, then you would unlock Sonic mm. along with Tails as like a assist trophy or something. Um, this was, of course, fake. Mm-hmm. This is not true. Um, it's It took a while for people to really to know if it was true or not, of course, because the rumor started before people were had done you know, had exhausted the game itself. And I think there were some, like, doctored screenshots, too. Oh, like, there were. Off-screen photos that they sort of, like, put a model from some other game mm-hmm. and, yeah. I think, for, or, or even like a hack or something like that. Poss- I think later on there were hacks to try to put Sonic in, but I think the um, the thing for me that cemented it as being fake was the simple fact that if there was Sonic the Hedgehog in Smash, they would have made a huge announcement. Yeah, that would have been a big selling point. Mm-hmm. But uh, of course, eventually we did get Sonic in Smash. That we was did. a big thing. So um, Sonic was added to Smash in uh, Brawl. Mm-hmm. And uh, is still a Smash character in the in the newest version, the Wii U version, and will probably continue to be um, a mainstay. I, I think in the series for the foreseeable future. Yeah, Nintendo and Sega, um, especially with the Sonic property, seem to have a pretty good relationship recently. Um, they've been doing. Uh, I think the first time Mario and Sonic were in the same game together was um, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Uh, right. So that yes. was like the first time they right. crossed over. And since then, like Nintendo's published Sonic games exclusively for their consoles. Um, that sort of thing. So yeah, I can definitely see Sonic being a, a mainstay moving forward. Yeah, and to me, I, I I think this is something that the um the gamer community likes to latch on to these kind of rumors because these are things that we wish were true. <laughs> um and then when it actually when uh some of the developers get a hold of it, sometimes they kind of make the that fantasy a reality. Mm-hmm. And uh that's exactly what happened in our next little story, um, which is about Diablo. Mm. Um this is a, a small little indie game you may have heard of. Uh, no, actually, obviously, I, I kid. It's a it's a massive, massive property that um, it has left a sour taste in gamers' minds uh, because of Diablo three disappointing. But uh, the first Diablo when it came out was revolutionary, mm-hmm. and it really influenced a lot of games, and still continues to influence game design to this day. Yeah. Um, I don't know how big of a, a Diablo player you were when it first released. Uh, I wasn't. Um, Diablo 3 was my first. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, I feel very sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like someone telling me their first experience with Star Wars was Phantom Menace. Um, but uh, getting back to Diablo, there had been this rumor that there was a secret level, a secret dungeon in Diablo with high level enemies that were cows. <laughs> and it was supposed to be this big developer secret that if you could just find find this level, you could unlock all of this the special equipment and um, oh, high, like cowhide armor and that sort of thing. Yes, high level gear. And, <laughs> yeah, cowhide armor exactly. Um, that was supposed to be some of the best stuff you could get. Um, all bogus, completely not true. But um, because of the the very rabid um, community that built up around Diablo. People didn't want to let go of this rumor. I mean, it it actually <laughs> stuck around for quite some time, um, all the way into the lead up of Diablo two, and um, Blizzard, you know, heard heard about these rumors obviously, and actually responded. And their response was, "There is no cow level." <laughs> Every time there is no cow level, <laughs> and um, they act to the point where it became almost a running joke. Uh, of course, this just fed into the rumors. Oh, they're just saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when Diablo 2 came out, Diablo 2 um, actually does have a cow level. <laughs> and the funny part here, and, and, and Blizzard kind of played with the community here, um, they continued to deny. <laughs> Anyone asked, they would always say there is no cow level. Full knowing that they actually had made a cow level <laughs> in Diablo 2, and it took people a little while to find it. Which just it. leads credence to the idea that there actually is one in Diablo 1. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was kind of the funny part, because when people started to find the cow level in Diablo 2... And they tried to share it with the community. Well, now it was Nobody kind of believed them. right. It was the boy who cried wolf situation. The boy who cried cow. Yeah, the boy who cried the the demon who cried cow. <laughs> right. Um, 
Yeah, nobody believed it. Everybody thought it was bogus. And it took a while before it caught on and people kind of realized, oh, wow, this is a real thing. This is, <laughs> this is funny. And um, But Blizzard would continue to, despite that, even after it became an open secret, would continue to say there is no cow level. Mm -hmm. And it just became kind of a running joke. Now I'm just waiting for the uh, Diablo 3 expansion pack um, invasion of the cows or something like that. Uh, I think I think Diablo 3's run its course at this point. Well, they're coming out with that new uh, expansion pretty soon, actually, the Necromancer. Really? really? Apparently a lot of people are looking forward to that. So ah, Maybe it'll actually fix the game. We'll I, see. I was pretty disappointed with it, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I thought it was a pretty cool, pretty cool rumor. Um, okay, so um, here's another very famous urban legend uh, is about, fit centers around Atari. Um, and actually the Atari 2600 is, is kind of legendary, uh, not just because it was a system that was very popular, but also because it is a system that is oftentimes credited as causing the video game crash, mm -hmm. uh, specifically certain games on that system, um, overhyped games, uh, two in particular, do you know which two those are? Uh, E.T. Correct. That's one. And not E.T. <laughs> <laughs> uh, E.T. was one. Do you know why E.T. was considered to be one of the causes of the crash? Um, I think, like, wasn't there something about they just made way too many copies, like more copies than they had consoles? Yeah, so so with E.T., um, essentially, yeah, uh, E.T., of course, was a massive film hit. I mean, it was a huge movie. Mm -hmm. um, and so the game itself, when, when it was announced that they were developing a, an Atari game for it, um, it became, it was this, it had this huge amount of hype around it. Yeah. And this is before people realized um, video game adaptations of film... <laughs> typically are terrible yeah but this is before people knew because vi video game industry was still in its infancy and um, when et came out well uh, they completely missed the mark when mm -hmm. it comes to estimating fan interest and not only did it not sell anywhere near expectations although it actually sold a lot better than it gets credit for mm -hmm. it was actually a, pr a pretty high selling uh, game um, for the system one mm -hmm. of the highest selling games on that system but they produced far far too many copies wait like you said mm -hmm. more than there were even systems mm -hmm. Plus, the game was terrible. I mean, it was not a good game. Like, didn't they rush it? It was something like a three-day development cycle or something yes, like that? It, it was. It was an extremely fast development cycle. And um, it actually had some some uh, creative ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was actually some free-roaming concepts, almost like, I don't want to give it credit for, oh, it was the first open-world game. But I mean, there, <laughs> there there definitely was some element of if It was, it was playing with ideas that, had they taken more than three days to make it, might have been interesting. And, and and also, I mean, the system itself couldn't, the console, I mean, could not actually support some of these ideas anyway. Right. Uh, but the game is, is a broken mess. I mean, I'm not going to make any excuses for it. It's <laughs> not a good game, even though I do think it had a few good ideas. Um, but anyway, yes, that was one of the games that caused the crash. The other game that caused the crash, um, well... It's one of the most popular games of the 80s. Battletoads? No, that was the 90s. <laughs> I know. Uh, but yeah, one of the most popular games of the 80s. It had its own theme song. You should already know the answer. Also a character in Smash Bros. Pac-Man? Yep. Pac-Man. So uh, Pac-Man was a massive hit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same deal, same story as E.T. Uh, same kind of concept was it was an extremely overhyped um, port because mm -hmm. people wanted to play, um, you know, they wanted to play a home version of Pac-Man, the game that everyone loved. Yeah. And the 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 port on Atari was terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's con considered one of the worst ports of all time. And same kind of situation. There was a lot of hype. Um, too many copies produced. And and this actually, these games are, are sort of credited, are, are typically kind of pointed to as examples. But it was kind of a general problem with the industry at the time where you would produce there were a lot of games being produced that were simply not quality. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why when Nintendo was able to bring us back from the brink of the crash and recover, mm -hmm. um, they introduced the Nintendo seal of quality to mm -hmm. make sure that the games released on their system were not utter garbage. And <laughs> gamers had a little bit of an idea of, okay, if I'm going to buy a game, at least it'll be playable. Mm -hmm. At least it'll be decent. And um, it was very helpful in the early days to get people back into gaming. Because at that time with, the, with you know, the Atari, sure, there were some games. I'm not saying Atari was had a bunch of only bad games obviously it didn't mm -hmm. it certainly had some good games but a lot of it was like almost a crap you didn't know it was going to be good or not and especially when you when you hear a name like pac-man you expect it to be good and it wasn't mm -hmm. so as part of the story um there had always been rumors uh dating back to around the time of the video game crash back in the uh you know 83 84 um 83 i think specifically of a bunch of of games specifically et was the, was the rumor it was mostly et uh, buried out in a landfill somewhere over in um, New Mexico or Arizona, mm -hmm. one of those kind of um, southwestern states. Yeah. But no one really knew where, and no one could really prove it, mm -hmm. and it became this kind of 
someone heard it from their uncle who worked at Atari or used to work at Atari mm -hmm. and it's out there somewhere. Trust me, it's there. And everyone kind of laughed it off. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of this rumor? I was. And actually, I always assumed that it was true. Really? Yeah. I, I never thought it was uh, in doubt. Do you have, do you, what's your earliest memory of hearing this? Because this is probably, I would say, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, ur video game urban legends. I want to say I was in high school, maybe, mm. when I like kind of vaguely heard about it. And then in college, when like I actually heard about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, 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 it stuck around for a long time. And people, to the point where, um, kind of like you, a lot of people just kind of assume that it happened, mm -hmm. but no one really knew the extent of it. It, it of course got exaggerated as, as all urban legends do, but later in, in 2014, um, you know, just a few years ago, mm -hmm. it, they, someone actually found that landfill in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, they found, they found, um, a lot of games buried out there actually. Um, and didn't they make ET a, included. Um, didn't they make a documentary about they that? They did. Yeah. Yes. Um, very, yeah, I think it was called, oh geez, I'm, I'm not going to get it right. I think it was something like What Killed Atari or something along those lines. I know Atari or, was in the title. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, this this is one of those urban legends that turned out to be true. And it really was. It wasn't even just like a few games. Because when I heard the rumor personally, I thought, oh, maybe someone buried a few games out on the desert. Why would anyone bury a whole bunch of games? I, especially when I was younger, I couldn't fathom uh, being such a, a, a fan of video games. I couldn't mm. fathom why anyone would, would bury any video game. Mm. I always thought, well, well, especially, especially when you're young enough that you can't afford your own. So like, right. you have to beg your parents for like five months before you get the one you're wanting, right. you know, it's like, Hey, I, I would still play. I'd still play it. Even if it's a bad game, of course, mm. me growing up in the, in the NES era, you know, I, I played some, certainly played some games that were bad, but probably not ET bad. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, this, this one turned out to be true. Yep. Mm hmm. Um, sometimes the uh, naivete pays off, right? Right. <laughs> uh, and and kind of sticking to that same era in the eighties, uh, this other urban legend, which is actually so persistent that to this day, despite being disproven, it's still there's still people that believe that it is that it is true. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the most persistent urban legends, and um, it is that if you when you're um, essentially the the nest that we got here in America had issues with uh, the contact. Sometimes the games wouldn't start up very well. Mm -hmm. um, we had a different setup than the Japanese version. The Japanese version was more like our Super Nintendo, mm -hmm. where you, you put a game card into the top of the system and pushed it down. The, the version of the NES that we got, at least the initial version, um, was more like a toaster. Yeah. Um, you, you opened it. Well, I say more like a toaster, but that's not really true. That's a toaster would be the other way around. I don't know why it's called a toaster, but it is. It's a little bit more like a VHS almost. It is more like a VHS. Yes. Um, but, uh, essentially you would, you would open, you would push it, push the game in mm -hmm. as opposed to pushing it down. Yeah. So. Or wouldn't you like sort of push in and then push down or something like that? Yes. And that was kind of part of it too. That was one of the things that broke it. Um, mm -hmm. in fact, the, it, the games are fully playable without pushing it down. Mm. <laughs> and in fact, it's probably better that you don't because it actually can mess the game up. The, uh, the springs in there can can give out. Right, right. Um, but yeah, so essentially the, the contacts, uh, some, some games wouldn't really connect very well with the system. And so you would put the game in and it would be kind of glitched out. It wouldn't work right or the game just wouldn't start. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, there's that whole thing of cartridge tilting where like yes. you intentionally bend it to sort of see what happens to the game. Right, right. And, and yeah, because of because of those contacts and the connectors and um, the way the system worked and, and what, you know, myself included, a lot of kids thought that we could fix this by pulling the game out and just kind of blowing into it mm -hmm. and then putting it back in. I guess the theory there is you're blowing the dust off the contacts or something. Exactly. That was the theory. But um, we later found out definitively they actually did studies on this. Uh, <laughs> yay, science, right? <laughs> science. Um, that this was this was only bad. It was bad for the game because um, essentially whenever you're blowing into something, even if you think what you're blowing is nothing but air, mm -hmm. you're actually still blowing some sp spittle. Yeah. Uh, that's the scientific way to say spit. Uh, <laughs> saliva. Saliva, yes. <laughs> but you, you get a little bit of saliva in there. And when mm. it gets, when those contacts get wet, um, it does corrode and rust and actually breaks down uh, the connectors. And so it was, it was not actually helpful at all. What was helpful was taking the game out and putting it back in and trying to like readjust mm -hmm. how those connections fit. And that was why 
um, we had that reaction to, oh, look, I blew into it and it worked. Oh, it mu- this must be what helped right, it. it was right. the blowing. It wasn't ever the blowing, mm-hmm. um, but people assume that it was. And to this day, some people will still swear up and down that that's actually what fixed their system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Were, you, are, were you aware of this? Did you? Have uh, yeah, I was aware of it. Um, yeah. I'd never had a nest, but I was definitely aware of the cartridge blowing thing. And I, even I think that it kind of survived into the SNES days where if there was something wrong with the SNES, they would try blowing on that. Right. Yeah. It did. It did. It, it Which was kind of silly because the SNES didn't really have as many of those problems in mm-hmm. part because it was a top loader. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how these sort of persist and continue and um, kind of get, since we've been talking about games from different eras um, into sort of a, the topic of how do these rumors start and how do they proliferate? Mm-hmm. Because that blown into your cart rumor, well, this was before we really had, we didn't really have the internet mm-hmm. and we had like Usenet boards um, towards the la- the latter part of the uh, the Ness's lifespan. Mm-hmm. Um, so we sort of had those, I guess, in like the early 90s. We could kind of... My, my most guess people is, didn't have them. in that particular case at least, the, it's probably a pop culture thing. Probably, right. It probably got um, canonized in some film where a gamer blows into the cartridge, and then that basically helped mm. spread the idea that doing that, it's a thing that gamers do. And even if you're not asking why it works or why it doesn't, uh, it's just like, hey, take it out, blow on it, put it back in, you're good. That's a pretty good guess. I, I I wonder if that is the case. Like maybe in a game like um, The Wizard comes to mind, a film like The Wizard comes mm-hmm. to mind, or um, the the ca- the Captain N television show where they had a little bit of a live action part mm-hmm. and, uh, occasionally. Um, yeah, maybe maybe that is the case. Or maybe in one of those, uh, they had gaming shows where they would play video games. I forgot some of the names of them. But um, yeah, maybe in some of those, they actually did that on TV and that kind of helped it spread. Mm-hmm. I know that it was something that you would hear people talk about other people, you know, in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I imagine that like maybe neighborhoods that never had that sort of got it through some sort of mass media mm-hmm. thing. From what I read with um, uh, Poly- Polybius that we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. um, I'm just going to do that. By the way, I'm just going to pronounce games differently every time I talk about <laughs> it. So with, with that game in particular, it, it did actually start um, those rumors were on early message boards, you know, the, in the early days of the Internet early forums and things like that um is where a lot of this stuff got proliferated and uh one of the one of the other examples of this too is um one that i think you know some about uh the majora's mask rumors with the the special game the game cartridge save file with ben i believe it was uh oh you're you're talking about the creepypasta yes yeah yeah um so yeah there was uh there's this creepypasta and for those of you who don't know it's kind of like a term for a meme that's kind of like a, a ghost story, but it's kind of presented often in this sort of um, uh, they, there's usually some sort of attempt to make it a, a legitimate sounding source. So like this actually happened mm-hmm. uh, like a lot of good ghost stories try to do. And, and you know where this was first posted? Uh, I'm guessing 4chan. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't remember the whole story, but I guess basically like someone uh, got like the sort of mysterious version of Majora's Mask or put the cartridge in the wrong way or something mm-hmm. like that. And basically it started haunting him. Uh, like things, weird things were happening in the game, which it's funny because like hearing them sort of describe, like if you sort of read the text of the story, it's actually a lot more affecting than watching the footage that supposedly came out of it. Oh, yeah. Because they're describing of like the feeling they got going through and like seeing all this weird stuff is much more impactful than actually seeing that weird stuff they were seeing because it's like, okay, it's just buggy. I, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't really scary at all didn't, uh, didn't the footage come later i think it did i think someone right. sort of like kind of imitate it because i i remember this is one of those times where i felt like um because this this urban legend grew way out of control mm-hmm. um honestly and it's one of those times where i feel like i was there on the ground floor because mm-hmm. i remember when this the very first time this started getting posted i was actually at the time um did hang around on on 4chan mm-hmm. a lot and I remember when this was first posted and I remember the story and I remember contributing to the thread and like all the people that were like, oh, this is bullshit or like <laughs> the ones that were trying to play along and the ones that, that bought into it. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it, of course, it expanded and it kept, it would get reposted. There would be slight changes to it. And mm-hmm. Like you said, eventually there were videos. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I guess the idea was that eventually the person playing this like kind of went insane or something like that. Very unsettled by the whole thing. Um, I think like one of the famous lines from there is uh, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh there were weird things like the um the happy mask salesman theme the windmill theme or whatever uh right. playing backward and this mm-hmm. sort of thing he was uh, always kind of creepy anyway. he, he was always creepy yeah. yeah uh but 
yeah, I thought that was interesting and kind of related uh, to Majora's Mask. Um, this is maybe moving a little bit away from urban legend and more into like, you know, game theory sort of stuff, uh, including like the actual YouTube channel Game Theory, mm-hmm. um, where uh, there was this one theory I recall about how Link is actually dead in Majora's Mask um, <laughs> yeah. and how they're they actually made a pretty good argument. They're sort of breaking down like all the the psychological stages of grief and how those were reflected in the game. Um, they were talking about how, for example, uh, whenever you have a mask that turns you into a Zoro or Goron or a Deku, um, basically, if they don't outright say it, they kind of imply that the owners of those masks died. And basically, um, you are sort of taking their spirit through these masks or something like that. Uh, and that's how you transform. So basically, you are filling the shoes of a dead person. Hmm. Um, and they noted that if you go to the uh, Stone Tower Temple, um, there are statues that you can create uh, using a special item that uh, are each of those forms. And there's actually a form that is you, uh, just human link. And so that, along with all the other sort of theming things, um, the argument they made is basically that it's a game about how Link has died. And this is basically purgatory. This is him kind of trying to um, his spirit kind of trying to come with, come to terms with the fact that he has died and trying to sort of like, like accept this and heal and move into the next life or whatever. Yeah, there's there's strangely a lot of little rumors like that that kind of get started um, with, you know, the, the hidden meanings behind games. Mm-hmm. Um kind of common there was a similar one with luigi Mm -hmm. uh with in in luigi's mansion the concept of oh luigi's actually dead (laughs) you could even see his shadow of himself um you know he hung himself and you could see his shadow (laughs) hanging from the from the wall and it does actually kind of look like it maybe was a shadow um i've seen it before but of course again these these are these are things that clearly they're not going to do that in a nintendo game Mm -hmm. nor it you can kind of stretch it for any for a lot of these games and kind of stretch the truth and and get these stories going and it seems it sounds fun and entertaining but it's clearly fake Mm -hmm. it's for something like that it reminds me actually and like this is a different medium but um we talked at one point a few episodes back about how we watched spirited away in my office and uh when we were doing that and i was kind of trying to like share some of the the background about like you know how this film came to be how japanese storytelling has a different style uh, someone found a theory about how um, Spirited Away is actually just a giant metaphor for um, the sex industry. Yes, I've heard that. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's like, and, and I think they even tried to confirm it kind of with comments from the uh, from Miyazaki uh, about how, like, you know, he's kind of comparing one thing to another thing. But that doesn't necessarily confirm that's what they're going for in this film. That being said, though, it is there's something to be said for like, hey, if you interpret a piece of art a certain way or you can find these themes in there, that's. You know, interesting analysis. You're free to do that. I mean, you can be wrong. (laughs) Uh, You're free to be wrong. But I I definitely don't think either in the case of Luigi's Mansion or Spirited Away that that's what they were going for. I think that they were making the story they were making. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I think especially in games like that, there's not really a hidden agenda or hidden message. It's just just pretty pretty upfront about what the game what the game's purpose is. Mm -hmm. You're you're vacuuming vacuuming ghosts. Right. That's (laughs) Um, yeah, and and. Another another kind of example of um, as we were talking about games where the the developer becomes aware of the rumors and incorporates it into the game. Um, another famous example of that, and I kind of had forgotten about it earlier, was uh, in Grand Theft Auto. Mm. Um, in in, in a, I'm sure you've played uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Have you? Do you remember hearing about the rumors of Bigfoot in that game? I heard the rumors, but never played the game. So, oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, kind G- of a, GTA Four was my first. Kind of a big deal, <laughs> uh, San Andreas, but um. <laughs> uh but yeah so it's um the rumor essentially was that somewhere out in the woods uh you could find bigfoot he was out there somewhere and if you could just if you could just find him he he was there and um of course there was again like the sonic rumors in, in smash bros melee there were sometimes um edited images there were a lot of very convincing rumors and ways that methods that you could possibly find him this is actually reminding me i forget i'll have to look them up and maybe like post about this later <laughs> Um, but there was actually a channel, um, I'm not sure if they were on YouTube or if it's just a gaming website or whatever, but they're actually trying to prove or disprove, uh, some of these myths. Oh really? Like and a myth so, busters for gaming? Kind of. That's kind of cool. And so like, I, I remember now that you're mentioning this, this is one of the episodes they did where they're trying to actually explore to see if they could find Bigfoot yeah. in this game. Uh, and yeah, so 
Yeah, continue. But yeah. that, it was interesting because there's actually people out there who explore this. That's sort pretty of stuff. cool. Yeah. Um. Of course, the the funny part about this um is that Rockstar, hearing all of this user feedback, um, when they made Grand Theft Auto Five, in which you return to San Andreas, mm-hmm. they actually included Bigfoot. Oh, nice. he, you can find Bigfoot. And I I have found him now. In order to find him, they actually do it in a very creepy way on purpose, which is, <laughs> which is great. It actually scares the sc- scared the crap out of me when I first saw him. Um, so you can only find – you cannot run into him like on, on foot. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a helicopter and, you're, and it's nighttime and you're looking through your, your um, sniper rifle mm-hmm. that has like heat vision scope on it, mm-hmm. sometimes if you're you know, in, in the woods and you're kind of like scouring over – and I forget the exact location. Um, but if you're scouring over like a, a certain area – and you're looking through in the, in, with the heat vision, you can not only – you can see Bigfoot. Like you can see him there. Mm-hmm. And um, he kind of like, you know, he notices you too. Like he's clearly – he's like moving and he looks at you. Mm-hmm. And it's only there for like a moment to the point where you – when you first see it, you could potentially doubt that you ever saw it. Mm-hmm. You could doubt that you ever saw it. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually quite creepy when you find him. Um, and Rockstar, at least – at least from what I've seen, unless they change their message, kind of pulls a um, a blizzard with the cow level. They still mm-hmm. they still contend that no, he, Bigfoot's not in the game. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a kind of a funny relationship. Um, yeah. So I kind of wanted to 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 end our our talk here about urban legends and gaming with a couple of uh, sort of outlandish urban legends mm-hmm. and kind of see what your thoughts are about them. So the first one I want to talk about. Um, it's not as ridiculous, but it's still kind of silly, and that's the Madden curse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and specific, have you heard of this one? Yeah, so b- from my understanding, it's basically that if you're on the cover of Madden, which is always a huge honor, it's actually like right. one of like the most prestigious things that can happen to an athlete is to be on the cover of Madden. Um, but very frequently, apparently, the people who are on the cover uh, that following season, uh, their performance just takes a, a huge dive. They do terribly. Their team does terribly. Uh, and so people have called it the Madden curse. If you're on the cover, you're going to do badly. And actually, this manifested fairly recently when Tom Brady was announced as the uh, the cover uh, athlete for the newest Madden that's coming out. Um, everyone's like, oh, no, he shouldn't have done that. The Patriots can be terrible next year. And he actually uh, released a statement saying like, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to prove the Madden curse wrong. Nobody has to worry. Yeah. Um, but it's like, oh, well, that'd be a funny irony if actually like Tom Brady, like this is his last year because he just like takes a, a, a dive bomb performance wise and has to retire basically because he just isn't what he was. <laughs> right. Something like that. I, I mean, we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's 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 very prolific curse because Mm -hmm. every year people are looking for a reason to validate it and and that's one of the one of the issues with this one and why it's so hard to prove to people that to disprove rather confirmation bias right yeah people that want to believe it believe it Mm -hmm. and um especially since it's it's specifically affects the nfl Mm -hmm. professional football um that's a very physical sport and players get injured all the time right and um a lot of the players that they um all the players they pick for the cover athlete are all high profile players Mm -hmm. so if anything bad happens to them in any way Mm -hmm. whether it's a physical injury or they um, have a poor performance Mm -hmm. it gets blamed on the curse it could even just be an average season that wasn't good enough to carry the team yeah the most recent example um another another Patriots player, mm-hmm. um, Rob Gronkowski, who is um, a very well-known um, tight end for uh, the New England Patriots. Good old Gronk. Yeah, Gronk. And <laughs> um, his he was on the, the, the 17, Madden 17 cover. Mm-hmm. And of course, he did get injured. He had, had a season-ending injury. But he's also a player that has a history of injuries. Mm-hmm. And he's also playing um, you know, a sport that is... Players get injured all the time. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's one of those things where um, it's a curse in the sense that no matter what happens to that player, even if they have a good season, mm-hmm. you can always find something to blame on the curse. Yeah. Um, even if it's like their personal life. Oh, they had a great year, but <laughs> um, oh, they you know they're they're they got a divorce. They're, or they're yeah. being sued. Right. Or, yeah. But yeah, it's 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 one of those things where uh, we'll just we'll just see. I mean, if if maybe Tom Brady will will completely shatter the concept of the curse, possibly. We'll see. Uh, what do you think he'd have to do? I think he'd have to be Super Bowl MVP. Honestly, I think anything short of that, people are still going to think it, there's a curse, especially given how high the expectations are for the Patriots from year to year. They, they've been just like this extremely great franchise for I, the past like 10, 15 I years think, or however long. I think he also has to be NFL MVP, like season mm, MVP. Yeah, yeah. And I think he, they also have to go undefeated. <laughs> yeah. And I also think they have to be 
to also win. Mm -hmm. Um, And also uh, Brady has to have a career year Mm -hmm. um, and his personal life has to be immaculate. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, it's It's true. They'll find something. If you're going to absolutely dispel the myth, like nothing could possibly be wrong, then uh, yeah. Oh, but then, of course, the uh, the curse is still active because it's just another form of witchcraft that has bestowed him with this magical power that uh, <laughs> I don't know. So. Yeah, he's he's he somehow broke the curse and therefore he's like an agent of death now or some <laughs> some insanity. I, it's 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 ridiculous. This is definitely one that that I don't believe in. I actually I actually would believe the um, uh, Polybius situation that mm. that being an actual game and and all those rumors being true more than I believe a Madden curse. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think the Madden curse is really just like. As soon as you award someone something prestigious, the expectations are high, the visibility is high, and anything less than perfection is going to be seen as not good enough. Yeah, and a big part of the curse, too, I think, is that the reason you get on the cover is because a couple things. One, your team did really well. Mm -hmm. And two, you as a player had a great season. Mm -hmm. And often a really good career, too. Right, but 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 they're they're always picking it because there's a new game every year. Mm -hmm. So they're picking a player that they think is like the most prominent in that uh, of that of that year i think for the past few years people have been able to vote too there has been some voting to it but but then again people are voting because they see that player having such a great year right yeah and kind of my point in that is that usually when a player has their career year the chance of them having another career year Mm -hmm. just statistically speaking it's almost impossible right so of course they're not going to do quite as well so it almost kind of lends lends itself Mm -hmm. to that exactly okay well i have one more to share and this one is actually quite possibly the weirdest urban legend <laughs> so i kind of want to get your thoughts on this one um so this is kind of an uh, an old one but this is this is stemming back from when um it sort of supposedly came out around uh, the late 2000s but apparently it was something that was had been going on for some time um and it involves uh the former leader and dictator i guess of um iraq saddam hussein ah. uh that but you know we famously of course went to uh two wars uh, um over and eventually um you know killed him He's dead, but uh, he appa- he was known for um, definitely some some weird eccentricities, and um, uh, he was not not a particularly good guy. No, um, but like a lot of um, dictators, uh, they they tend to have some weird eccentric uh, tendencies. Mm-hmm. Like, um, for example, um, Hitler was well known to be very into the occult. Mm-hmm. And had did did a lot of uh, research into the occult, and actually went out and searched for various occult artifacts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So there's this is not without precedent mm-hmm. that people might believe that one that these dictators are a little bit unhinged. Apparently, uh, if the one of the books I was reading recently is to be believed too, um, despite all the Nazi propaganda against uh, Mickey Mouse, um, because of course Disney was a big American, um, you know, media company at the time. But interestingly, despite all the propaganda, um, a gift from uh, oh, I forget the term of uh, the actual title of the person, but the person who's kind of in charge of Nazi propaganda, uh, a gift, a birthday gift to Hitler at one point was a bunch of Mickey Mouse movies. Really? Yeah. Wow. So apparently he was uh, a fan. Apparently he was a fan. Wow. Everyone um, looks, loves a Mickey Mouse. Man. Everyone loves Mickey Mouse. Well, uh, <laughs> so Saddam Hussein was involved in his own little uh, strange experiment, apparently. Um, so during kind of the height of his reign, uh, as the story goes, um, Saddam Hussein started to uh, stockpile PlayStation 2s. It's a good console. Yeah, and the PlayStation 2 was, of course, known for, um, it's still, I mean, I believe that the highest selling console, um, it, in part because it had such a long life. Mm-hmm. Its its life cycle was very, very long. It went well into the PS3 era. Yeah. Um, and, and so the rumor here was that he had stockpiled um, over 4,000 consoles within the span of a few months. Hmm. And what do you think his reasoning here was? Um... I guess it was sold out and he was scalping them. He wanted to sell them for a profit. No. <laughs> so so I think this this reason um, kind of actually ended up co- becoming a little bit true later on. I'll kind of get to that. Um, but the story goes that he actually wanted to essentially connect all of the PS2s into sort of a a supercomputer of sorts with all of the 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 um chips because apparently they, they were relatively cheap at the time the hmm. PS2s when he was getting them towards the end of the life cycle so that he could put all of those quote 128 bit processors as they had, <laughs> they had claimed they were um as if that meant anything um put them all together to form a missile guidance system 
<laughs> that he could he could power his missiles to be able to fire them all the way to the United States or anywhere in Europe that he wanted. I feel like there are easier ways to get supercomputers. See, and that's kind of kind of the thing. <laughs> it's like this is it, it's it's relative. It's pretty silly to think that you can just string together a bunch of PS2s and suddenly have like one of the best uh, I, missile I, systems in the world. I would sooner believe he was stockpiling them because he liked PS2s and he didn't want other people to have them or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, this is this is one of those weird rumors that um, I'm sure it's not true, but how do we prove it? I yeah, mean, yeah. it's 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 one of those things where it's kind of probably why it's um the, who who does the uh the burden of proof lie with you know right yeah. and and like a lot of these you can't really you can't so much I mean there, with a few exceptions but you it's really hard to disprove something beyond a shadow of a doubt mm-hmm. um really you could just say well there's no evidence mm-hmm. um you can show other evidence of something else and say well then therefore this is probably not true mm-hmm. but you can't really. You can't. You can't say definitively. This is right. absolutely false. Right. You can only prove yeah. something happened. You can't necessarily prove something didn't happen. You can prove something else happened. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So um, it, it's certainly why a lot of these stick around. Um, the funny part about that rumor, though, is that um, the PS3 itself, during um, when it was sort of announced by by Sony, and one of the things they used to try to market it, um, they talked about what you could do with the PS3 and its power. I don't know if you even remember this when, when the PS3 was coming out and some of the Sony, you know, marketing speak. I remember there's a lot of hype about how powerful they were. Yes. Yeah. And they also talked about how, um, apparently this was done, um, by, Oh geez, some school or, or government agency, but they basically took a whole bunch of PS threes and net networked them together to form a very powerful computing system. Hmm. So this was actually done with the PS3. So it's almost like, um, I don't know. um, life mimicking the mm-hmm. the, the myth <laughs> sure. but uh but not for a missile defense system per se mm-hmm. but for to form a a more powerful computer mm-hmm. so there's a little bit of truth to it i guess yeah yeah i mean that's not an uncommon thing too for example in like say render farms for video or 3d animation yeah. to spread out tasks across a, bu- across a bunch of different machines to have the same task done much quicker than with a single machine uh so it sounds like that's basically what they were doing there mm-hmm. all i know is that if, if we hear about uh, kim jong-un stockpiling a bunch of ps4s mm. watch out anyway uh it's been an interesting discussion um if you guys uh, out there actually happen to know of any other uh, urban legends perhaps that we didn't mention or that you think are interesting feel free to drop us a line at inbox at backward compatible.com and uh, we might mention that on a future episode so thank you everyone for joining us for episode 105 of the backward compatible.com podcast our discussion on video game urban legends I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. And we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.